Good morning, Shoreline family. We are so blessed to have you here with us today for worship. Uh, we've got a special service lined up for you. If you love to study the end times, we're going to be taking a look at that today. Uh, today we are in our fourth lesson on the book of Joel, and we're going to be studying the Valley of Decision from Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. So if you haven't already done it, I want to encourage you to take out your Bibles. I wish I could hear the pages turning. It's, it's, it's awesome to, to hear people going through the Word of God together. And uh, we'll go verse by verse through this study. But before we do that, we've got Stephanie and Holly and, and Jesse here. And you'll see the words on the bottom of your screen. I hope that uh, you go ahead and, and you guys sing your hearts out. And then the last thing that I wanted to ask you is, as the message begins, if you go ahead and you hit the share button on the bottom right hand of your screen, then at that point it will go out and uh, it just exponentially takes the message out to many, many more people than would ever hear it by coming to our Facebook page. So thank you for your help in that. Uh, I hope your hearts are prepared and ready today for a tremendous service. And Father, we do thank you that we can gather here today. Lord, it's our desire to honor you. It's our desire to worship you in any way that we can. And I pray now that as we prepare our hearts for the message that's coming, Lord, that as we sing, that we'll sing our hearts out to you, realizing that it's to you, an audience of one in whom we're, we're worshiping. And so, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We ask for your presence to be here today in a very powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. When the music fades, all is stripped away.
I invite you to join me in prayer. Lord, we do want to know you more deeply. We do want to know you more intimately. And God, I just ask right now that as we, we begin to prepare our hearts to enter into your word today, that you would open up your word so that we would see things in a way that we've never seen before. Lord, we love you, and we want to know you. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, which we, we just sung about just a moment ago. And I pray, Lord, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that your word would go forth in a way today that would bless many people. Lord, you said in your word that your word will not return void, but that it will accomplish what you please. And that would be my prayer today, Lord, that as we, we begin this sermon here, this, this time in your word, Lord, that you would accomplish what you please in the hearts of the men and the women and the boys and the girls who are watching. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Well, Shoreline family, it's great to see you here once again, and I encourage you, if you haven't already done it, to open up your Bibles to Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. The title of the message today is going to be The Valley of Decision. You know, we can push God only so far. In fact, sometimes we're, we're disobedient to the point where we think we're getting away with it, but we're not, because God is watching. God never sleeps. God never slumbers, and when we turn our back on him, and we walk away, there's always consequences to pay. That's what happened with the nation of Israel. We see in 721 BC that the northern 10 tribes ended up turning their back on God, worshiping false gods. And as they did, God ended up bringing the Assyrians in and took the 10 northern tribes captive, scattered them all over the world. And then we see in 586 BC, that the, the Babylonians ended up coming and the, the, they took the two southern tribes. You've got Judah, you've got Benjamin. Both of them had walked away from the Lord. And they ended up scattering them, or at least taking them into captivity for a period of time. They came back into the land. Israel's back in the land, but never as it was before with the kings. And then we see that come AD 70, they had rejected Christ. And exactly one generation later, we end up seeing what happens. Titus and the Romans come in. They end up destroying the temple. They end up killing about a million people. They took the Israelites that were left there, and they took them out in the dispersion all over the world. And for almost 2,000 years, Israel was scattered everywhere. Well, I've got a parallel sermon that's playing to today's message, and it's the 1948 restoration of Israel prophecy, the Valley of Dry Bones. And I encourage you to, to check out that one too, because like no other sermon I've ever done, it points specifically to the Bible prophecies, prophecies that pointed to the 1948 restoration of the nation of Israel. But all of this ties together as well, because I want you to imagine for a moment you end up with the Jews being dispersed all over the world for almost 2,000 years. It gets to the point in which people are thinking, this, the, the, this is never going to be taken care of. They're never going to return to the promised land. In fact, people would just about mock the possibility. And you had premillennialists, pre I can't say it, too bad, huh? premillennialists that, uh, that were prophesying that Israel would be restored to the land. Well, there's a theology book that I happen, happened to be reading not too long ago, and it was by Louis Burkhoff. It's called Systematic Theology. It's from page 699, and this statement was written in 1938, and this is what he said. He said, premillennialists have exploited the scriptural teaching for their particular purpose. They maintain that there will be a national restoration and conversion of Israel and that the Jewish nation will be reestablished in the Holy Land, and that this will take place immediately preceding or during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Burkhoff goes on to say, It is very doubtful, however, that Scripture warrants the expectation that Israel will finally be reestablished as a nation, and will as a nation turn to the Lord. Some of the Old Testament prophecies seem to point to this, you catch that? Some of the Old Testament prophecies seem to predict this or point to this, but these should be read in light of the New Testament. Does the New Testament justify expectation of a future restoration and conversion of Israel as a nation? And I have to say, yeah. I mean, we're seeing it in our own time. Burkhoff wrote this in 1938. 
10 years later, just 10 years, one decade later, we see that on May 14, 1948, that Israel was miraculously restored to the land just as God had prophesied in Scripture. I hope you'll take the opportunity to watch that other video so, so you can see how that all ends up coming together. But at this point, I want to encourage, if you would, to go to Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 16, and we'll take a look at the Valley of Decision. And I'm going to begin by reading verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I mean, throughout the Bible, God is talking about he's going to restore the Jewish people when they repent. We saw that last week as we went through the passages that as the people repent, God would restore them by blessing their land once again. But on May 14, 1948, after almost 2,000 years of the dispersion, we see that the Jewish people came back to Jerusalem. And it's so cool, you can Google it and, and take pictures of 1948 as the, the Jewish armies come back in and, and they rush towards the Wailing Wall and the Jewish soldiers are in tears as for the first time in all of those years, they're back in the Promised Land. What an amazing time that we live in. We live in a day and an age in which the prophets long to see. And for many of you who are watching today, you may have been born even before that and you remember that time. What a time that we live in as we approach the end times. And this was one event that had to happen before the end times could possibly take place. Well, in verse 2, it continues and it says, And I will gather all nations, and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. We've heard that name before, Jehoshaphat. And we know that Jehoshaphat was a king. But what we don't realize so often here as we look at this particular passage is that Jehoshaphat means judgment. So when we see the valley of Jehoshaphat, what we're seeing is the valley of judgment, and that judgment is going to be the judgment of God. Verse 2 continues, And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. When we talk about the valley of Jehoshaphat, we're not sure exactly where that valley is going to be. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, of theories one of the theories is that that valley is going to be in Jerusalem, and we'll see that a little later as I go through some of these scriptures that we're going to be look at. looking at. Some of the people say that perhaps it's an extension of the Kidron Valley. Uh, I'm not quite sure. There, there's others that say, well, the valley that we're talking about because of other scriptures is the Valley of Jezreel. And the Valley of Jezreel is also known by another name, and that other name is the Valley of Armageddon or the place of Armageddon. Well, Jehoshaphat, once again, uh, it, the name means Yahweh, or it means the Lord judges. And sometime after Israel's restored to the promised land, which makes our day and age so special, sometime after that, God will call the nations together as they come to battle Israel in judgment. As we look towards the end times, there's a couple of things that we're going to see. First of all, we're going to see God's judgment will bring about the total and the final destruction of those nations who oppose God and who oppose his chosen people, Israel. The second thing that we're going to see is that Jesus Christ will come and establish his millennial kingdom for 1,000 years in which he reigns over the earth. And so as we approach the end times, we can be looking for the, the judgment of God upon the nations. We can look at the return of Jesus Christ to, to be... Uh, to, to be Lord and Savior, to reign over the earth for 1,000 years. The prophet Zechariah also talks about this time as well in the future. We see in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 3, he writes this, he says, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. It's really neat to be able to see this, that uh, the, the Lord will go forth, the Lord will be fighting, He's going to fight on behalf of Israel when that day finally comes. We see in Zechariah chapter 4, when we go to the next verse, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north, and half of the mountain shall move towards the south. Some people believe that the valley that's being spoken of in verse 2 is actually going to be created at the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
I've got a friend uh, from back in Fremont when I lived back there. His name is Bill Gamberg, and Bill is a Messianic Jew. And Bill would share the story of his testimony with us, and it was pretty powerful. He grew up on the streets in San Francisco, and he said his mom would walk with him to school sometimes when he was a young boy, and they had to pass a Catholic church. He said every time they went to go past that church, his mom would take him across the street and tell, him, tell Bill that those people are really nasty people who beat little Jewish boys over the head with a cross and rush them on by. But one day, Bill ended up coming to Jesus Christ as his Savior and his Lord. And as he did, and as he finally was praying to receive Christ, he tells the story of how he literally fell back against the wall. And he was so afraid that because this little Jewish boy had come to faith in Jesus Christ, that God was going to strike him dead with lightning, that he put his hand over his head to protect himself just in case that lightning came like it was really going to protect himself. And he began to slide down the walls and crying as he received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now, for Bill, he took his faith seriously, but in the early years, he still had some questions. And he decided that he was going to get on a cargo ship and he was going to sail over to Israel. He was going to go and he was going to plant himself on top of the Mount of Olives, so that when the Lord Jesus Christ came and that mountain divided in two, that if he was wrong, he could still go back on the Jewish side. But if he was right, he could be with Jesus. Well, that never quite happened for him. But uh, it's interesting that he would think to the Mount of Olives, and we know that when the Messiah returns there, that that mountain is going to split. And that mountain is going to form one massive valley. Well, the point here is that this valley symbolizes the coming judgment of the nations. Verse 2, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people. So often we see what's happening and uh, we think God's not watching us right now. He's, he's, not, he, he doesn't, he's not acting. Things are happening. There's so much anti-Semitism in the world. There's so much hatred towards the Jewish people. And you wonder, where is God in all of this? But those who persecute God's people are going to have to answer to God one of these days. He's not going to hold back forever. We're going to see that the day is going to come in which God deals with the enemies of the Jewish people. Herbert F. Stevenson says this, Men dismiss the biblical teaching concerning judgment to come for individuals and nations as a now outmoded concept. But the people of God have, have held fast through all the generations to the assurance that in the day of the Lord, the judge of all the earth will do right. That is our confidence based on the rock of Holy Scripture. You know, you talk about judgment, and you've got so many churches today that don't even want to mention that that judgment day is coming. But we see in the clear teaching of the Word of God that a day of reckoning is coming, and that day of reckoning is especially going to be addressed to the enemies of God's people. Sometimes it doesn't seem like God's working in a situation, especially when times are tough. But I got to tell you, God is. And I don't think we see that any clearer than back in World War II when Adolf Hitler was attacking the Jewish people. In World War II, Hitler justified the extermination of millions of Jews by removing their status of personhood and considering them to be lower than the animals. In fact, Adolf Hitler once wrote this. He said, I do not look upon the Jews as animals. They are further removed from animals than we are. Therefore, it is not a crime to exterminate them since they do not belong to humanity at all. Do you see what Hitler did? Hitler gradually worked upon the German people to remove that status of personhood so when the time for killing come, that those people would be able to freely do it. He dehumanized the Jewish people. But why is there so much hatred for the Jewish people in the world? And I think that's because they're God's chosen people. And the Jewish people have survived through all of these years. Satan is their arch enemy. Satan wants to stop the Jewish people. He wants to destroy the Jewish people. Warren Wiersbe says this. A Jewish proverb says, No misfortune avoids a Jew. No people have suffered more at the hands of their fellow men than have the Jews. Pharaoh had tried to drown the Jews, but instead his own army was drowned by God. Balaam tried to curse the Jews, 
but God took the curse into, turned the curse into a blessing. The Assyrians and the Babylonians, who I talked about already, captured the Jews and they put them in exile. But both those great kingdoms, both of those great kingdoms, excuse me, are no more. Well, the Jewish people are still with us. Haman tried to exterminate the Jews, but he and his sons ended up hanging on the gallows in the book of, of Esther. And Nebuchadnezzar put three Jews in a fiery furnace only to discover that God was with them and that, they were, and that he was able to deliver them in Daniel chapter 3. You see, Hitler tried everything that he could do to exterminate the Jewish people. But I think it's important for you and me to remember what goes around comes around. In 2013, Cheryl and I had the opportunity, along with several people from our church family, to go to Jerusalem. Uh, we did the tour through Israel and through Jordan, and, and then we ended up going to Jerusalem. And it's kind of one of the highlights as it ends that you go to the Yad Veshem, or in other words, the Holocaust Memorial that they have there in Jerusalem. As you walk around, they've got pictures all over the place, and you've got the recorders as you walk up that you hear the stories that uh, describe what the Jewish people had to go through. And then as we approach the end of the tour that we are in, we turn a corner and we came around and all of a sudden thousands of shoes were underneath us. And, the, and this room was a huge circular room and, and it looked like volumes on the wall everywhere for just stories high. And each volume was the life of a person. And as you look down underneath the glass, you saw all of these shoes and these were shoes of the Jewish people who had gone into the gas chambers and they had been exterminated for their faith. And I got to tell you, you want a, an emotional ending to a tour. It just strikes right in the heart and you understand just how vicious Adolf Hitler and the Germans were against the Jewish people as they tried to exterminate them. But I've got a news headline for you, and that's this. Adolf Hitler is dead, but the Jewish people are still here. Amen? God keeps his word. And today, it may not be Hitler, but today we've got the Muslim people who absolutely can't stand the Jews. And how about the Muslim people? Uh, uh, their desire is, is to get Israel out of the land. They say that that is their land. They're willing to push Israel into the sea. In fact, that's their goal. They, they, they want them gone. And that persecution is going to continue coming as we move towards the end times. But God will hold nations accountable for the way that they either treat or they don't treat Israel. In fact, as we go back into Genesis chapter 12, verses, uh, verse 3 here, for, it's actually 1 through 3, but I'll show you verse 3 here. God makes a promise to Abraham, and that promise is this. God said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all of the families of the earth, they shall be blessed. Now, through, through Abraham, how could that be? Well, the fam all of the families of the earth were blessed ultimately through the Messiah, ultimately through Jesus Christ. But as we go back, that promise is there. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I don't know about you, but I want to be the, on the side of blessing. Because the point here is those nations that are out there that are persecuting the Jewish people and have persecuted them over the years are going to have a day of reckoning. Those nations are going to have to answer to God, either for the way that they treated the Jews or the way that they didn't treat the Jews. You say, what do you mean didn't treat the Jews? You know, we look at our own country and... Uh, for years and years, we were extremely supportive of Israel, and we see that with the current administration. But on the other hand, there's probably 50% of the people in our country who aren't supporting Israel today. And if we finally turn our back on Israel, we can expect that we'll be judged like the rest of the nations and in the same sort of a way. Verse 3, they have cast lots for my people, and they, they have given as boy, as a boy, they have given a boy, as payment for a harlot, and they've sold a girl for wine that they may drink. You see, the persecution against the Jews wasn't just limited to Adolf Hitler. Even back in the day of Joel, that persecution was happening. It's been happening for years. It's going to continue happening. We saw it with Nero during, during the time of the Apostle Paul, you know, how he would take uh, Christians, he would burn them out in the the gardens, but even in those days, they hated the Jews, and there was issues that were, were happening there. 
But it was happening in Joel's day, and it's still happening even today. Well, it may appear that God's not paying back the wicked people as they attack his people, but you better believe that the day is coming in which he will. In Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, Paul writes this. He says, But in accordance with the harshness of your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. So it may appear on the surface that these nations are getting away with it, but what God tells us is that the impenitent are storing up for themselves wrath on the day of wrath. There's degrees of punishment in hell. Adolf Hitler is going to be punished at a different degree than Joe the barber down the street that doesn't know Jesus. Adolf Hitler had killed millions of people. He had gone against the Jewish people. God's going to hold people accountable, and we need to realize that because the day of decision is coming, and that's what the message is about today. Verse 4 continues. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, in all the coasts of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head. You know, the Phoenicians were known to be slave traders in the, East, in, in, in the ancient world. In fact, I've got a map up here for you on the screen to see. And you can see that the Phoenicians with Tyre and Sidon were up north of Israel. But the Philistines were a little bit to the west. They're a little bit on the southern part. But what you'll notice with both groups of people is that both groups were located upon the Mediterranean Sea. This put them in the perfect location for them to be able to be slave traders. You had the Greeks who were coming over to get the slaves, and these individuals, they hated Israel. They wanted to get rid of Israel. They wanted them out of there. And so uh, they ended up sending slave traders, thinking that they were getting away with it. They, they were prospering by hurting the Jewish people. Do you think that God didn't see that? I think God did. In fact, when they're fighting against the Jewish people, we need to realize that not only from, from Tyre and Sidon and from Philis, the Philistines, when anyone fights against the Jewish people, in reality, they're fighting against God. And when we fight against law, God, you've got to be stupid to do that because when we fight against God, we're going to lose. Well, Robert B. Chisholm Jr. wrote this. He said the judgment threatened here probably was fulfilled at least in part in the 4th century BC. The people of Sidon were sold into slavery by Antiochus III in 345 BC. Well, the citizens of Tyre and, and Gaza were enslaved by Alexander in 332 BC. Perhaps the Jews were involved in some of these transactions. And so once again, what goes around comes around. And were these nations at one time were taking the Jewish boys, they're taking the Jewish girls, they were selling them into slavery. The day would come when now the Jews are taking these individuals and they sell them into slavery. What goes around comes around. Verse 5, because you've taken my silver and my gold and carried into your temple my prized possessions. One of the things that you'll notice as you read through this passage is the, the several times that the personal pronoun, my, when God is speaking, my comes up. In fact, eight different times you'll see that, my silver, my gold, my prized possessions. But when God says that, he's not talking about the silver and the gold that's in his temple in Jerusalem. What he's talking about is plunder in general. So verse 6 continues, also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, you, you have sold to the Greeks that you may remove them far from, your, from their borders. You see, when a nation attacks the Jews, they end up attacking God. And when they end up ta attacking God, God takes it personal and he doesn't forget. And so the question here is why did the people of Tyre and Sidon and all the coasts of Philistia sell the Jews? Well, number one, we see in this passage, they wanted to get rid of them. They wanted to remove them from the territory. And their location was absolutely perfect for the slave trade. And so they prospered financially by taking these people, God's people, into captivity and selling them. Verses 5 through 8. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temple my prized possessions, 
Also, the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, you have sold to the Greeks that you may remove them far from their borders. They wanted them out of the land. Behold, I will raise them up out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters to the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. Do you remember what I was saying, that what goes around comes around? We see it here once again. In fact, if we talk about the, the Sabians, who were these people? Well, another name for them would be the people who lived in the land of Sheba. And if you were to decide or ask the question, where is Sheba today? Uh, I've got a map on the screen for you where you can look. And, and just south of modern Saudi Arabia, you see a country by the name of Yemen. And that's where that country of Sheba would be. Now, in the Bible, there's a famous queen that came from that land. Do you remember who it was? Yeah, it was the queen of Sheba. And when she came up to Solomon, uh, she treated him with respect and she treated him with honor. And apparently that relationship continued even to this day. And you see that it was the people of Judah who took them and they sold them to the Sabians. Robert B. Chrisholm Jr. says this, the Lord would rouse his dispersed people and put them in the position of slave tra traders. They would sell the sons and the daughters of the Phoenicians and the Philistines as slaves to the Sabians. An Arabian people noted for their commercial activities. The judgment threatened here probably was fulfilled, at least in part, in the fourth century. Uh, we see that Alan explains the people of Sidon were sold into slavery to Antiochus III in 345 BC, where the citizens of Tyre and, and Gaza were enslaved by Alexander in 332 BC. Perhaps the Jews were involved in some of these transactions. And so once again, we see that what goes around ends up coming around and where the people had sold the Jewish boys and girls into slavery, now you see that the Jews are turning around and selling these individuals into slavery. Have you ever looked recently at a map of Israel as it relates to the rest of the world and as it relates to all of the Muslim countries around them? It's an incredible thing to see. You know, God promised a future for his land. And as you look at the world and on the map that you're looking at, all of the red that you see are Muslim countries uh, around Israel. And we know that they would like to see that nation destroyed, that people destroyed. We know that they would like to see them pushed into the sea. And it's frightening as we look at that and we see uh, just the danger that Israel is in. It's, it's a country uh, 390 miles long by, at its widest point, 80 miles wide, but the populated area isn't much larger than the San Francisco Bay Area, if you've ever been down there and, and had a feel for that. Well, as we look at the map here, it's, it's a God thing that Israel is still there in the land. In fact, if someone ever asks you, how do we know that we can trust the Bible? Maybe you've had somebody ask you that. I have at different times. But one reason that we can trust the, the Bible is because of the Jewish people. God keeps his promises. And even in spite of the most incredible conditions, with all of these kingdoms being gone, Israel is still here. Even in the danger that they're in today, Israel is still here. And we can trust the Bible because the Jewish people are back in the land in the exact year that God promised that they would be there. Well, God will crush the enemies of Israel on the day of the Lord when Christ returns. Verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up, mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come. Wake up, God is saying. The people were sleeping. They didn't realize what was happening around them. They didn't see the signs. Like today, many people don't see the signs of what's happening around. I wonder if as a nation, if, if we're sleeping, if we don't see what's happening worldwide, if, as, if we don't realize the importance of the restoration of Israel to the land. Question for you. How would you prepare for war physically if you were summoned all of a sudden? You're getting ready to go for war. We see this in verse 9. What do you do? Do you get on a proper diet? Do you go out and you get on an exercise regimen so that you can build your body up? Do you want to get to the point where you know your enemy and that you've got a plan for warfare? Well, how do we do the same spiritually? Do we get on the proper diet of the Word of God? 
Do we exercise ourselves with things like praying and worshiping God and preparing our hearts to meet him? Do we get to know the enemy and the way that the enemy operates? That enemy is Satan. That enemy is his demons. Do we get to know them and the way that they're operating out there in the world? And do we have a plan as we go forward? Well, how do we train ourselves spiritually? We use those disciplines. You see, a battle was coming. And militarily, there's no country in the world that's got greater military might than the United States. But I got to tell you, fighting with God, we don't have a chance. And if we as, as a nation continue doing some of the things that we're doing, if we as a nation continue to fight against God, we don't have a chance. And, and our military might does not impress God. In Psalm chapter, one, uh, Psalm chapter 147, verses 10 through 11, the psalmist writes this. He does not, meaning God, he does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. If we want to be right with God, we need to reverence him. We need to respect him. We need to respect his word. You see, is our country ready for the coming judgment of God? I don't think so. You know, do we realize truly, all of us, that Israel is God's chosen nation? He's God's chosen people. I don't think that many of us do today. And in fact, I think more and more Americans as time is going by are moving away from the nation of Israel and the support for them. Do we understand that Jesus is a Jew, not that he was a Jew, that Jesus is a Jew, he's a resurrected Jew. The Jewish people have a special place with the Savior. You know, are we right with God? And the other question I'd have to ask you is, are we right with God's chosen people? Verse 10 continues, and it says, Beat your plowshares into swords, and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. You see, the world better be getting ready for war because war is coming. And I think it's interesting that the imagery that's used here is that of an agrarian society, is that of farmers. And when God communicates in the scripture, you'll see so often that he communicates to the people that he's talking to in a language that they can understand. And so here he talks to people in an agrarian society with the tools that they use in their everyday farming. They're to beat their plowshares into swords and their pruning hooks into spears, and they're to let the weak say, I am strong. You see, verse 10 is preparing even the common folk for war. Armageddon was coming. The description here is very different from that of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This is a description of war. We look at the millennial reign of Christ. It's going to be a time of peace. All of the nations will one day stream to a peaceful Mount Zion during that millennial period. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, Isaiah writes this. He says, He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. You see the difference going from warfare to peace? They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. You go to the millennial reign of Christ, and there's peace. We see in Micah chapter 4, verse 2, many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. That would be in Jerusalem, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of, out of Zion, the law shall go forth in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So when we're in that millennial reign of Christ, we're going to see from Jerusalem, that's where, where the word of the, of the Lord goes forth. And then finally in Micah chapter 4, verse 3, he shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. And once again, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. The nation, nation shall, not, shall not lift up sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so once the millennial reign comes, we find that that warfare stops, and now you're seeing peace in which the people are out there, and they're now taking their swords, and they're now farming with that. 
Verse 11, assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. The people had better be ready to meet their maker because that final warfare was coming. And my question to you today would be this. Are, are you ready to meet your maker? If today was the last day on earth, are you in a right position with Christ where you know that you would be right with him and that you would be able to go to heaven? It's something to definitely think about. Verse 11b, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Who's Joel referring to here? Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Those mighty ones are the holy angels, and they're under the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the day of the Lord is not a day for unbelievers to look forward to. It's going to be a day of judgment. It's going to be a day that would strike terror into the hearts of people. In the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, Amos writes this, he says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into a house and he leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? I think we need to understand that the day of the Lord is something that believers can look forward to because we're going to see that we're getting closer to going to heaven at that point. But for the unbeliever, it's a day that should strike terror into the heart of people because they're going to have to answer to God for all of the sins that have been done in the past. And we can either answer to God ourselves or we can receive Christ and he answers us for, or he answers for us and we are forgiven. Well, look in your Bibles, if you would, to verse 12. Joel continues, Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Remember the valley of judgment. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. I've got two observations that I wanted to share with you. The first is this. Have you noticed in verse 12, it says to come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. If, in fact, this is in the area of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is always referred to as up in the scripture. It's at an elevation of 2,490 feet above sea level, and so it's always referred to as being up. And here it says, let the nations be wakened. Let them come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. The second observation I have is that the nations are oblivious to their need for Jesus Christ and the coming judgment that's coming upon them. We see that all over the world today, don't we, as churches are shutting down. You go to Europe, and what once is where the, the, the Reformation took place. It's, it's where so many things happen spiritually. I think it's something like 2% of the people go to church. And how many of those even go to solid Bible-believing churches? Verse 12b continues, and it says, There I will sit, God says, to judge all the surrounding nations. You see, God himself is going to go ahead and judge the nations. And this isn't the sheep and the goat judgment that we see in Scripture. This isn't, uh, th this isn't in reference to salvation. This is in reference to warfare that's going to be taking place in the last days. Where will this final judgment take place? We find in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, it says this. And they gathered them together in the place called in the Hebrew Armageddon. As you look at the picture there, you're seeing a, a giant valley. Uh, I've seen that vision from the top of Mount Carmel. That's probably where the picture was taken as you're looking out and you get a feel for the valley. We know that at Armageddon that all of the armies of the earth are going to gather. This is supposed to be the place where that last great battle ends up taking place. But the interesting thing here is this valley is 20 miles long and it's 15 miles wide. And to bring all of the armies on the earth, you may be able to get some of them in there. But there's been so many ancient battles that took place in this, this, this valley. I think here it's being used symbolically in, in, in reference to all of Israel. In other words, all these nations are going to come against Israel. And this valley, although some fighting will probably take place here, is symbolic of the entire nation and all that they're going to face. But God has been waiting for this attack, and he's ready for it. In fact, in verse 13, we see it says, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. 
come down for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness is great. It's interesting to see the changes that have taken place in our country today. Uh, we get the 4th of July and you might hear the battle hymn of the Republic playing in the background and you'll hear the music but you probably won't hear the words. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but the words are moving out. If you take a hymn book, you'll go into the hymn book, you'll find that, that battle hymn of the Republic and you wonder why is that in the hymn book? Because that book is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you go back and you listen to some of the patriotic songs, it's amazing how they tied Jesus into the story of our nation. And in the battle hymn of the Republic stanza one, I'm gonna ask Stephanie Allers if she would go ahead and sing the words of that song for us. I'm gonna spare you from hearing me sing because I can't hit those notes. But listen to the words and how it relates to the scripture here. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Thank you, Stephanie. I want you to look at the screen. And in the green print down there, you'll see the word hallelujah. Do you realize the word hallel, H-A-L-L-E-L, -L -E -L, is the Hebrew word for praise? The three letters Yah is in reference to the name, the holy name, that covenantal name of Israel, Yahweh. And so what hallelujah means is praise Yahweh. But did you catch the words there? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord talking about the second coming of Christ. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, praise the Lord. My question with such a great song is why doesn't the government want us to sing those words today at public events? And I think the reason for that it's because it's about Jesus Christ. And they just don't want to acknowledge Christ anymore like we used to when we were a younger nation. What's changed? Has the song changed? Or have we changed as a country? And I think we have to say that we've changed as a country. Perhaps this week you looked on the internet and you saw a story in Minnesota. And in Minnesota is the Muslims. They've got a large Muslim population there. As they're preparing to... Uh, as, as they're preparing to go into Ramadan, uh, they've gotten governmental permission now to put out a big, large, loudspeaker in which they're going to do the Muslim holy call to prayer every day. And the article that I read said that literally thousands of people are going to be able to hear that. And I have to assume uh, that means Muslims and non-Muslims alike. When I was in Jordan several years ago, Cheryl and I were in Amman, and we're, we're staying in this really fancy hotel. I think it was 12 to 15 stories high. And it was a long day. We were tired. We went to sleep. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden I started hearing something. And I'm wondering, what is that? Why did the, al why did the uh, alarm radio go ahead and go off at 3 o'clock in the morning? And so I got up to see if the radio was going off, and it wasn't. And I started walking over to the sliding glass door that looked over Amman. And all through that city you could hear that Muslim call to prayer going at 3 a.m. blasting over loudspeakers. What do you think would happen today if we started using loudspeakers in our neighborhood to sing praise to God, to sing praise to the Lord Jesus Christ? You think that would go over? Then my question is, is why is it going over with the Muslims? Why are we seeing that happening in Minnesota? We live in changing times, and we as a nation, we need to be careful. Verses 13 and 14 continue uh, as we see that they, uh, they, they, they end up tying the, the scriptures and pointing to the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
In Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 18, it says this, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having, his head, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This has been preparing for a while. So he who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle into the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out, and, uh, came out of the temple, which was in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had the power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice, a cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for the grapes are fully ripe. Sometimes we think God's not watching. God is watching. This continues on in verses 19 and 20 of Revelation 14. It says, So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth, and he threw it into a great winepress of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for one hundred or for one thousand six hundred furloughs. You think one hundred six thousand one hundred six thousand boy am I getting that wrong? One thousand six hundred furloughs long. How far is that? I want you to imagine hundred and eighty miles long. hundred and eighty miles long by four feet deep. That's the amount of bloodshed that's being described in this particular passage. You see, at his first advent, Jesus was the tender lamb of God. At his second advent, he was the roaring lion of Judah. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 13 through 14, it continues and says, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. We know that's Jesus. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses, continues. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, when Jesus came the first time, he was the tender lamb of God. But when Jesus returns again, he's going to be the roaring lion of Judah. We live in the age of grace right now, but that grace is not going to last forever. And it's so important for each and every one of us to be in a right relationship with Jesus Christ because that day of decision, that valley of decision is coming. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Whenever we see a repetition in the Hebrew, it's, it's saying that there's special emphasis. And the prophet Isaiah talks about the second coming of Christ as well. Very similar. If we go back 700 years before Christ, uh, Isaiah 63 verses 3 through 4 says this, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trampled them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments." and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. God has not forgotten us. You see, ladies and gentlemen, today world population is somewhere right in the area of 7.6 billion people. And everyone is going to have to stand before God. We're going to either have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment of God. And we're going to either have to stand there on our own merit or we're going to be there on the merit of Jesus Christ, which is the only way to salvation. You see, the valley of Jehoshaphat or the valley of judgment is called in verse 14 the valley of decision. And the whole world is going to have to make a decision of what do you do with Jesus Christ? What do you do with him? Do you receive him as Savior and Lord or do you reject him and fight him? Verse 15 continues, the sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. We see the same wonders in Joel chapter 2, verses 30 through 31, being referred to by Peter on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus also talks about these signs and wonders. 
In Matthew chapter 24, verses 27 through 29a, Jesus says this. He says, For as lightning comes from the east and it flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever a carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark. And we've got cosmic signs. The sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes on the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and with great glory. Can you imagine that? All of the people in the world. In fact, you look at, at Christians. I've heard um, tests that have been taken with various questions to see if you could kind of estimate how many born-again Christians there are out there, how many evangelical Christians who stand by the Word of God. And you know, in the United States, people say 85% of the people here are Christians. I think now it's crept down to 77%. But when they begin to test, you end up finding that it's less than 7% of the people who hold to a biblical world view. And people out there who thought they were saved when Christ ends up coming back or those who have just flat rejected will look up and they'll see Christ in the clouds with great power and great glory. And I'll tell you, that ought to strike fear in their hearts if they've rejected Christ throughout the course of their lives. Verse 16 continues. The Lord will also roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength for, for the children of Israel. Did you notice what happens here? Look at it again in verse 16. The Lord will roar from Zion like a, like a, a, a roaring lion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. But look what happens. The heavens and the earth shake. Do you realize that even inanimate objects have the, same, the sense to tremble at the holiness of God? And my question is, is why don't we as people tremble to the holiness of God? Do we reject him that, that much that we just, we're not even going to tremble? Well, I'll tell you, the day is coming when people will tremble. You see, Jesus will obliterate the enemies of God at his second coming when he returns with his holy angels to set up his kingdom. And my question is this, are we ready? Are we ready for the second coming? Are, are we ready for the return of Jesus Christ? So I look at our country and some of the challenges that we've had, I've never seen a time like we have today. It's, it's so frustrating to watch the news and to try to capture any kind of truth at all. But one thing I know is that this country needs to be right with Christ. We need to repent in a whole lot of areas. We need to repent when it comes to the approval that we give to abortion. We need to repent when it comes to the way that we allow sin to be called right, righteousness, and we as churches back down. We need to be willing to stand for the word of God and the truth that it brings. And even in all of this, with all the problems that we have, there's, there's a promise for us in Scripture. It's really for the Jews, but I think this promise would apply to us in a certain sense as well. And we see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. The Bible says, If my people who are called by my name, that's God speaking, if my people who are called by my name will, number one, will humble themselves, will realize that they're wrong, will realize that they've done sin, and pray, that means humbling ourselves and getting on our faces, acknowledging the wrongs that we've done and seeking God to help. And then the third one is seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then, so often as we're going through the Old Testament, you'll see if-then prophecies, and this is one of those. If we repent, if we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we seek God's face, if we turn from our wicked ways, then God says, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. It's not just our nation. You know, right now, how about our family? How about our friends? Do they know Jesus Christ as Savior? Right now, we are blessed to live in the age of grace, but that age of grace is not going to last forever. And we see the signs of, of the end times are coming, and ladies and gentlemen, there's no guarantee for tomorrow. There's no guarantee that Jesus Christ won't come today. 
before you finish watching this service. We need to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. And if we're not, then we're going to have to stand on that judgment day and answer for ourselves. If we are ready, then by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, he paid the penalty for our sins, past, present, and future upon the cross. And when we put our trust in him, then we find forgiveness. And he gives us new life. We're we're born again. We're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We're given that new life in him. So our sins are taken and they're applied to Jesus upon the cross. But something else has to happen. His righteousness is then taken and it's applied to us so that when God sees us, he sees us as he sees Jesus and we're forgiven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word, as tough as it's been today. Uh, and yet, once again, it's a, it's a warning. It's, it's a wake-up call for a people, a country that's asleep spiritually. Lord, I pray that for each of us as Christians, that we would be the church, that we would be Christ to the world. Help us to have the eyes of Jesus, Lord, as we look around to the lost people within our community, people that don't know Christ and have rejected him. And Lord, I pray that if there's somebody out there today who's heard this message and they realize that there's no other name, nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord, if there's somebody out there like that today, I, I pray right now that they would surrender their life to Christ, that they would pray a prayer like this, Lord Jesus, I have sinned so much. I've done so much wrong, and I ask for your forgiveness. I ask, Lord, that you would come into my heart and my life to help me be the kind of person that that you want me to be. Lord, I repent. I change my mind. I change my direction. And Lord, I surrender my life to you this day. Thank you, Lord, for dying for me. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray to receive Christ today, I, I hope to hear from you. I hope that you would just write me at pastor underscore M. Bernard at hotmail.com. That's pastor underscore M. Bernard, Amazon Mike, uh, at hotmail.com. And uh, I'd love to hear from you where I can contact you back. We're going to go ahead. We're going to finish with one more song. I hope this song is a blessing to you, and I hope that you sing, sing your heart out. God bless. Jesus, be the center, be my source, be my light, Jesus.
Well, Shoreline family, it's been great to have you here with us today. And uh, I tell you, the, the more that I get to know this church family, the more that I love you. And you are incredible. And I want to thank each and every one of you. I get the report still of people calling, checking on people and encouraging people and, and being in the church, coming behind the scenes and helping people. Uh, even in difficult times, it's, it's been amazing to see how generous the people have been as, as they've continued to provide for the needs of this ministry. And uh, we can't say thank you enough. But as we end this service today and we go on out, it's been tough being away from you for so long. And uh, I'm hearing more and more the church family wants to gather, the church family wants to worship. We're looking forward to the day when that can happen, when we can begin moving in that direction. And so in the meantime, uh, let's keep working together as we can and, and calling and encouraging. Uh, once again, I encourage you to share the message if you're blessed by it today. It helps us to get the word of God out. And let's just close in a word of prayer, and I'll look forward to talking to many of you this week. And for the rest, I'll see you next week. Lord, thank you so much for this day and, and this time that we could gather together to worship you. And I pray now that as we end this time together, Lord, as we prepare to go out this week into the community, some of us, some of us are just stuck at home right now, but wherever we would be, that we would be a shining light for you. Help us to see this community with your eyes and the need that this community has for Christ. And then allow us, Lord, as the church, to be the church and to share that love with others. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. We love you.